<clears throat> so let's look at the, uh, uh, we'll start with the, the global positioning system. This is going to be actually kind of central, so I'll, I'll, make, it, I'll make it central. So <laughs> how does GPS work? Okay, so, so um, in this picture of D GPS and in anything that has to do with general relativity, time goes up and space goes sideways, right? So this is different, you know, in engineering time goes from left to right. This is not an interpretive modern dance yet. In, a, in, a, in physics time goes from right to left. And, um, but in general relativity time goes from bottom to top, which is kind of a hopeful way. You look at the universe as a whole, it sort of like grows from the Big Bang, right? So, and in, in GPS, you have clocks that are moving through space. So you have satellites that are following geodesics through states. They're following inertially through space. So here's a clock. This clock in the, the, the rest frame that I drew right here is, is standing still, right? Because it's not moving. So it starts off at 3 o'clock and then it ticks and 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 ticks. And, ticks. and then by here, it's now at like, you know, uh, 415 or something like that. Okay, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> and here's another clock, and this clock is zooming over here at something close to the speed of light. Let's say these clocks are all synchronized in this frame to begin with. So this has a lot fewer ticks because according to this clock, this one is moving at a relativistic speed, so it ticks slower. And so this one has only like accumulated a few minutes. And here's another clock, and this clock is moving in the other direction, not at the speed of light, so, but it's, you know, it's ticking away, it starts off at 3, and now it's a little bit better, and this one goes to 320 or something like that, okay? All right, so these are clocks we imagine. I had to, in order for the purposes of this talk, I had to, um, well, they're in a three-dimensional volume. Let's say this volume is of radius r, all right? Uh, so this, they lie in a three-sphere of radius r, a three-dimensional sphere of radius r, and we're going to follow them over time t. But for the purposes, because of the, of the, uh, the um, I don't know, the, it's a very nice whiteboard, by the way, but it is two-dimensional, <laughs> and so I had to draw them projected onto a, a one plus one-dimensional uh, surface, which actually is going to prove useful later. And so these clocks exchange signals with each other at the speed of light. So here's a signal going out this, and here's another signal going back to this clock. Here's another a signal going out to this clock. This clock exchanges another signal with that clock, uh, et cetera. Okay? So the clocks exchange signals with each other, and the signal tells you the tick of this clock at which the time on this clock at which the signal was sent out. And when it arrives at this other clock, this other clock records the time at which the signal was received. And from this list of signals, and list of when the signals left one clock and when they received and how many ticks occurred in between them, you can reconstruct space-time geometry. I mean, for example, with your, your ordinary GPS system, I'm waving my ordinary GPS system around here, right? With your ordinary GPS system, uh, uh, you can... So, so your thing is moving with, with nearly the speed of light. Yeah. The signal has to catch up with it, huh? Yeah, yeah, the signal has to catch up with it. So this signal, I should actually, according to this clock, this signal would be kind of red-shifted. Uh, okay. Right, yeah. but yeah. Yeah, yeah it's a, I mean, it, there, there are tricky things about this, but, but you know, basic, the basic feature is, for instance, in GPS, GPS, and f figuring out where you are is an example of this. If you can get the signals from four clocks, then you can figure out where you are in space and time because you've triangulated your position in space and time, right? And in fact, you know, GPS, it's not, you, no, you normally use it to figure out where you are in space, but you also find out where you are in time to, you know, within a nanosecond or two or a few nanoseconds, which is kind of useful though. I mean, I'm not gonna time this talk to within nanoseconds, all right? Okay. So does anybody want to complain about how GPS works? I actually, for doing, I've done a lot of work on the physics of GPS, for instance, um, uh, the physics of how accurately you can measure when signals depart and when they arrive. So how, how accurately you can measure time of arrival. And then there's a very nice set of physics for how accurately clocks can tick out time. And I'm only going to tell you a small part of this. Um, but in fact, uh, people who actually do do real GPS tell me this is basically how it works, and I think it's how it works. 
Um, so the first question is who invented GPS? Well, the first GPS system was, a, was a, like many things, like the internet, it was a DARPA project, all right? Um, uh, but I'll give you a hint. So, so you know, this notion, um, first of all, what famous physicist was very interested in measuring space-time geometry and came up with, famous for coming up with Gedanken experiments, you know, thought experiments for how you measure space-time geometry? Yes, correct. So there you go. All right. <laughs> Lifetime supply of ice cream for this gentleman right there in the second row. <laughs> yeah. Einstein, right. So Einstein's, this was Einstein's thought experiment for how you measure space-time geometry. And the idea is if space-time geometry is flat, then, you know, you can map this set of ticks of clocks and clicks of detectors onto ordinary flat space-time. But if it's curved, you'll find if you're trying to, say, measuring out some, like, some two-dimensional surface, you'll find that you have to regard this two-dimensional surface as, as curving within, you know, within the three-dimensional surface with which it sits. Okay? So this is, this is how Einstein's uh, thought experiment now, you know, now realized all over the world, and it's very useful. Okay. So let's, uh, uh, now let me, um, I'm going to give... Two, uh, let's see, I, I don't want to discriminate against people on this side of the room, so I'll, but I'll, I'll try to keep roughly in the middle here. So uh, there are, um, so first I'll go over here, then I'll go over there. So um, two fundamental limits. These are limits to how fast a clock can tick or how fast a detector can click. Because what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to give, first give a limit in terms of the amount of energy in the space-time volume about uh, how many ticks of clocks and clicks of detectors and like wiggles of waves you can have in this space-time volume. So the, what I'd like to, to get to put a limit on is essentially, you know, how many events can be crammed into this volume. It's kind of a picture of how many pixels, you know, is it, is it, a, is, you know, is it, is it a retinal display, you know, <laughs> picture of space-time, or is it something more blurry? So that's what I'm going to derive, okay? And to do that, we're going to, there are two <coughs> famous limits for um, uh, how fast talk clocks can tick and detectors can click. So the first one is the so-called Heisenberg limit because it was basically written down by, he by Heisenberg, and it says delta E delta T is greater than or equal to pi H bar over two. I mean, normally it's like something like H bar over two, but the clocks are discrete systems. They have discrete set of states, and for discrete systems, there's a pi over two in this. And um, so let's just first discuss a little bit about what this means. This is just the, this is the spread in energy of the system. So it's the expectation value, uh, if you like, of um, uh, the square of energy, my, the expectation value of energy squared, if H is the Hamiltonian of the system, times this. So now what is delta T? This is, the, this is a key question. What is delta T? So um, there is an old and incorrect interpretation of this Heisenberg energy time Heisenberg uncertainty limit, which says, in order to measure the energy of a system to accuracy delta E, you have to take time delta T that's greater than or equal to pi h bar over 2 delta E. So to measure it to a greater accuracy, you need to take longer time. I think Heisenberg himself even may have said this. And the problem with, with this, and it makes, it sounds good, right? Like many things about Heisenberg uncertainty principles, right? Like the my fav favorite Heisenberg un uncertainty principle joke is uh, the policeman, traffic policeman stops Heisenberg and says, Professor Heisenberg, did you know how fast you were going? And he says, no, but I know exactly where I am. <laughs> <laughs> I, have, I have a few more bad physics jokes, but I'll save them for later on here. <laughs> right, so, uh, so this interpretation is incorrect. Um, in 1960, a Hironoff and Bohm showed that you can measure, you can make a, a, you know, a model of measurement based on the von Neumann pointer measure of 
pointer variable model of measurement where you can measure the energy of a system as fast as you like, even if the spread in energy of the, even to any degree of accuracy as fast as you like. The point there is that the spread of the in energy in the measurement apparatus has to be big, but it doesn't have to be the spread in energy of the system. Okay, so that's wrong. But, um, and in fact, uh, uh, Asher Perez, who wrote a very beautiful book on foundations of quantum mechanics, was so disgusted with the misinterpretation of the energy time uncertainty principle that if you look in his book, uh, on, in the index, it says uh, under energy time uncertainty principle, it says turn to page 252. And that's the page you're on. And that's the only mention of it in the book, <laughs> is in the index referring to itself. Okay. So <clears throat> there is a, an, a, a correct interpretation. And delta t is just the time it takes for a clock to tick, to tick. A detector or a detector to click, or for that matter, a bit to flip, or in general, the time it takes for any quantum system to go from one state to a distinguishable and hence orthogonal state. So um, it's not that hard to prove, actually. You, you just, this is just really the, if you take the fact that E is equal to h bar omega, you take E equals h bar omega, and then this says uh, uh, delta, uh, oh, delta omega, delta t is greater than or equal to pi over two. And this really, this is just really a, theory, a theorem of signal processing due to Cauchy, actually. It's a Fourier transform kind of theorem. Okay, so are everybody happy with that? That's what the proper, that is a proper interpretation, a correct interpretation of delta t here. All right, so, uh, and don't let me ever catch anybody talking that who came here ever saying that, you know, it takes time. Uh, <laughs> delta t is equal to pi over h bar delta e to measure energy to accuracy delta e. There's another less well-known theorem, which is the one that we're actually going to use, which is called the Margolis-Levitin theorem, named after Norm Margolis, who's at MIT, and Lev Levitin, who's a professor at, uh, now to retire at Boston University. And that says that E delta T is greater than or equal to pi h bar over two, where E is equal to the expectation value of the energy system over the ground state energy. That is to say, the actual measurable energy of the system, right? Because the measurable energy of the system is the energy over the ground state of the system. Um, uh, it's easy to remember because you just take the Heisenberg relation and you erase the delta, and it turns out to be true, but the proof is quite different. It is nonetheless a, a theorem. So these are just theorems about quantum systems. Okay. Um, and actually, if you're if you're if you're interested uh, in, you don't have to have a proof, but if you're interested in an example, which I think will make this kind of plausible, if I have a a spin, and uh, let's say spin up is the ground state, and I start and spin down is the excited state with energy e1. <coughs> or E down, sorry. So we'll take the ground state energy to be zero. Sorry, let me, let me I'm not, not doing this very, very well here. You would think that in, after insisting on giving a talk on a blackboard, I would have better blackboard or whiteboard technique. So it starts off at T equals zero in the state which is spin up in the X direction. And then at time when E down times T um, is equal to pi H bar, then this has gone to, uh, so at t equals zero, then um, this is equal to spin up. And at uh, t is equal to pi h bar over e, uh, e down, this is equal to spin up in this direction. Right, it's just a spin processing. And you see that the energy of this system is um, uh, uh, e, down over two, and that's also equal to the spread and an energy. 
And this processing spin, if you look at these two relations, this processing spin saturates this bound. And I think that for people who deal with processing spins, and I know that there are people in this room who deal with processing spins, okay, <laughs> then um, uh, you can think it's pretty plausible that a spin can't process any faster than its Larmor frequency. And it happens to be true for a systems of arbitrary dimension as well as for spins, okay? Um, and the interpretation here of delta t is exactly the same in both cases. It's the time it takes for a clock to tick, a detector, detector to click, you know, a wave to wave up and down, or you know, a photon to propagate from here to there. So, is everybody happy? People, some people don't look very happy. <laughs> okay, that's what I want. I want those people to look happier. Right? I just want to make people happy. That's all, all I really want in this kind of context. Okay, good. So. What we're going to use is um, this Margolis-Leviton theorem here. Because the Margolis-Leviton theorem relates the number of ticks and clicks and wiggles of waves to um, the uh, amount of energy that the system has. And in particular, what we now have is that um, applying this Margolis-Leviton here, if I, um, I define the number of ops, I'll call it, because I do you know, quantum computers and things like that, an op is when something happens, like a bit flips or, <laughs> so an op, so I'm just gonna find an op, a kind of quantum op to be um, E, the energy, where E is the same energy of this, all, now of all these clocks and signals, uh, two ET over pi H bar. This is kind of the net phase relative to the ground state that the system has accumulated, then, <clears throat> the total number of ticks, clicks, you know, flips, <laughs> etc., is less than or equal to this number of ops, which is equal to 2 et over pi h bar. Okay? So that's a, if you just, you know, say, okay, there's some energy over here. I put this much energy in this photon. Here's how fast that can move from one state to an orthogonal state. Here's the amount of energy in the clock. Here's the, how, much, how rapidly that can move to one state to an orthogonal state. Amount of energy in the detectors, et cetera. The total number of pixels, okay, in this, in this three plus one dimensional volume, this three sphere followed over time t, is uh, less than or equal to this. All right? Okay? Please interrupt if at any point something is, is not clear. This is, um, uh, this is actually pretty straightforward. There, isn't, there, not, there are no tricks. I'm, I, you, may, you probably don't trust me at all after my what's my line stuff, but <laughs> this, is, this is a straightforward application of um, these two limits, which really are the limits that you use for, to, for, for looking at, for instance, the how accurately you can measure things if you use funky entangled or squeeze states and stuff like that. So delta t for the still clock and the moving clock is the same, but it's changed by the uh, basically the theory of the relativity. Right, exactly. So, so what happens is for the still clock and the moving clock, the interesting thing is that um, uh, uh, the, um, here uh, the moving clock is, is uh, yeah, the, sorry, yeah, so the number of ticks and clicks uh, is just energy, it's just, sorry, so the number along here is just the energy momentum tensor times delta t mu nu integrated over time. And so it's a, this is the, this is the, you know, this is the energy time product, and you see that this is a covariant quantity, so uh, all observers agree on it independent of what reference frame they're in. So it's, it's, which is good because since we're gonna be talking about Einstein's equations, we want to do things in ways that are nice and covariant. And, and another way of thinking about this is that this number is essentially a scalar quantity. All observers agree on the number of ticks that, right. that yeah. clocks yeah. tick between one point and another. All right, so on the face of it, there doesn't seem to be much of a, any particular limit to how, how accurately you could you know, map out this volume of space time because you just, put in more energy, right? You put in more energy for your clock so they tick faster. You put in more energy for your signal so they wiggle up and down faster. You cram more clocks into the volume so you like, you know, have more pixels in there. You know, you can keep on going and going. Of course, you know, 
because you do have, this is you know, something that's as Einstein wants us to do, this is a gravitational system. As you put in more energy, you're going to warp space-time. It's going to start to curve in the way I described before. But that's okay because your clocks and signals and detectors are now mapping out curved space-time. And they'll do just what Einstein wanted them to do, which is give us a picture of the curved geometry of space-time. Okay, except you keep on going and you put in more and more and more and more energy and space-time curves more and more, and then what happens? Right, I heard it there. The, uh, <laughs> that's right, lifetime supply of natto to this gentleman in the front row. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, uh, yes, <laughs> hope you have a big fridge, that's all I can say, and a good appetite for natto. Um, <laughs> uh, yes, you form a black hole. If you put in too much energy, you form a black hole. In particular, <clears throat> um, uh, uh, if we, we ask, we're going to demand that the radius of this volume be greater than or equal to the Schwarzschild radius, which is equal to 2gm over c squared, which using the fact that, uh, which one should always write down if one can, that e equals mc squared, Right, one should always write down e equals mc squared in a legitimate context. This is 2ge over c to the fourth. All right? Actually, so now, now let me ask you another question. So who first wrote down this relationship that light can't escape for something whose, uh, if it's denser than the Schwarzschild radius, more compact than the Schwarzschild radius? This is, this is a trick question. So, does anyone? No. How about Schwarzschild? No, it's not Schwarzschild. I'm sorry. Hawking. Hawking. No, it's not Hawking. No, no. Well, Schwarzschild wrote down wrote down this with the S, I think, because it's called the Schwarzschild radius. Right? <laughs> no, actually, this was written down by Laplace because Laplace actually. Oh, this is kind of a fun thing. So Laplace said, okay. Here's a particle of light. Remember back in the 1790s? This was in 1798. They thought that light was a particle. And it's moving with velocity c. And it has kinetic energy. The kinetic energy of the particle is 1 half mc squared, where m is the mass of the photon. Now, now this is... This is so wrong in so many ways. I, I really don't want to like, get into it, but Laplace didn't know it was wrong. He thought, okay, it's a Newtonian kind of thing. And if you ask that the kinetic energy uh, uh, be greater than or equal to, so 1 half mc squared, be greater than or equal to the potential energy, so you, it's trying to escape from this thing of radius r with mass m over r, right? Then that says that r has got to be greater than or equal to 2 gm over c squared. So, so he got the right, so he said, oh, if light is like a classical particle and something's denser than the black hole density, then light can't escape from it. And this was, some B British clergyman had me mentioned this and then Laplace did this, the calculation and he got the right answer. I mean, by a method which is so, 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 so wrong. Uh, I think the trick is that there are two factors of two in general going from Newtonian gravity to general relativity and here they canceled each other out. Okay. And this, by the way, if you ever forget the Schwarzschild radius is a really good way to, <laughs> to recalculate it. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> All right. So we put these together, um, and we get, so yeah, and I mean, so we're going to demand essentially that, we're, that nothing be denser than a black hole, as viewed from the outside. And also, we really should request that in our GPS system, that a bunch of clocks and signals are not at a density greater than the black hole density, because if they are, then they're not helping us measure space and time. I mean, there's nothing wrong with being a black hole. I have several computers that have that feature. But uh, uh, it's bad when a piece of your GPS network becomes a black hole. Right? Are people okay about this? So we're going to demand this. Okay? <laughs> I think it's pretty reasonable, personally. <laughs> well, we put this together, and that says that the number of ops that within a space-time volume of radius r followed over time t 
is less than or equal to, uh, let me look at this, it is, I have a 1 over pi, the factors of 2 cancel out, I have a c to the fourth, I have an h bar down here, I have a g down here, and I have a t times r. All right, and this in turn is equal to 1 over pi uh, r divided by the Planck length times t divided by the Planck time. And this is the result I was looking for before, and this is this fundamental bound on measuring space and time. And I call this uh, the quantum geometric limit. It's a quantum limit to measuring space-time geometry. And let me note some things about this. So is anybody, are, are people okay with this? It was, this is like, I, it took me quite a while uh, to derive this because you had to frame it, but once you actually frame it, then it's really, it's a two line, two, well, three line, <laughs> three line uh, derivation. It's, you don't even need the back of an envelope. The back of a stamp would do. Okay, so. What are features of this? It's easy to derive, <laughs> right? I don't think anybody's gonna deny that. I had to like, in fact, I had to kind of slow things down by giving people natto in order to make, to draw it out, to make it appear that something was actually happening. I could have made it a lot faster. Uh, uh, it's easy to derive and it's also, um, so, it's, it's definitely right. There are some caveats that, that, that from general relativity, but this is, this is correct. Basically, in general relativity, if you have a sphere of radius r and it's got more energy than that, there will be a horizon surrounding the sphere and it won't work for you for GPS. But the answer, I claim the answer is unexpected. Um, uh, <coughs> In, in the sense that, and this is an, uh, a, um, this is an experiment I've done. If you go and, um, if before you tell people what the answer is, if you ask a group of people, I mean, actually here, maybe people would not, not, even, not even want to worry about it. But if you go to like a bunch of particle theorists, like quantum field theorists, so, so quantum field theorists would say, oh, you know, uh, the Planck scale, this, oh sorry, I should say, th this Planck length, right, so the Planck length is, you know, on the order of 10 to the minus 33 uh, centimeters, and the Planck time, uh, the Planck time is on the order of 10 to the minus, 5 times 10 to the minus 45 seconds. So they're very small numbers. And, and Planck originally defined these numbers to say, um, what is the scale at which both quantum mechanical and gravitational eff effects are important? It's a scale, actually, in fact, Planck's argument is if I have one clock or one quantum, and I ask that the single quantum not be a black hole. So the quantum is delocalized over its Compton uh, uh, wavelength. And if you ask that the Compton wavelength, wavelength of a particle not be smaller than its Schwarzschild radius, then you get this, this, uh, uh, this limit. And you can see actually that's kind of like the kind of the zeroth order limit of this, you know, where you have one clock and you demand that your single clock not be a, like an elementary particle and you demand it not be a black hole. So what a quantum field theorist will tell you is, oh, well, you know, we don't know what happens below this Planck scale, it's smaller scales than the Planck scale, but um, we do know that there are quantum fluctuations and space-time is bubbling around at something like the Planck scale, so a quantum field theorist will tell you the answer is, we just count up the number of Planck scale volumes, so that's the number of volumes and we follow them over time at the Planck scale, so that's what they would tell you. And I, I've done this experiment, so that's what they do tell you, okay. Or as long as, as long as they haven't heard this talk or read the papers, uh, then they'll tell you that. Now there's a fancier version of this. So quantum gravity people, um, in quantum gravity, there's this, this thing, I, I'm, maybe, maybe thing is the wrong word, I'm not sure, thing called holography, which says that, holography says that the number of bits in this volume is, um, uh, proportional to the area of the volume, 
the sphere that surrounds this volume uh, divided by the Planck length squared. So it goes as r squared over the Planck length squared. It's called holography because the idea is somehow that it's a really weird idea in many respects, but uh, the idea is that somehow all the uh, uh, bits that are in this volume can be thought of, this three-dimensional volume can be thought of as being projected onto the two-dimensional surface of the volume at a density of no greater than the Planck length squared. And it's true for a black hole. I mean, if you look at Hawking radiation coming out of a black hole, then the number of bits in Hawking radiation just exactly saturates this. This is not, there's no proof that this is true. Like, I mean, this, there's, not, there's no argument like this, right, that holography is true, but people generally accept it for a variety of reasons. So holographic people will tell you this. And it's not, but it's not. <laughs> The actual answer is basically RT over Planck length divided by Planck time with an extra factor of pi thrown in for good luck. So it's kind of funny. I mean, it's not what you would think. I mean, you basically there's basically only three different things it could be as that are a function of R dimensionless things. You are calculating a dimensionless quantity. It's a function of h bar. It's a function of g and it's a function of R and T, and there are only really three dimensionless quantities it could be, and the guesses that people would make are the first two, and they're wrong. So, what's going on? Well, the, the first thing is that um, uh, there is kind of a holographic notion to this, like holography says we take these bits in this volume and we project them onto this two-dimensional surface at some density of the Planck length. So here what's happening is you can imagine, what does this say? It says, I can't put any more events in this volume. There's a four volume now, right? Three plus one dimensions. I can't put any more events than if I were to draw little tiny uh, <coughs> Planck scale boxes, two dimensional boxes around each event. <coughs> Right, if I drew these little Planck scale boxes, so this is a box of the area Planck length times Planck time, if I were to project all the events that happen in this volume on a two-dimensional surface in space and time, a so-called world sheet, which I actually already had to do because, because of the lack of 3D whiteboards, right? so I already did project it, then it says that the density of these events cannot be greater than the Planck scale. So there is a kind of holographic, space-time holography kind of feel to this. Okay? So, that's the end of the first part of the talk. How, how, much, how much time do you want me to, to go for? Um, Leaving time for the interpretive modern dance at the end. Ten more minutes or so? Ten more minutes. Okay, good. Great. Yeah, sure. That's great. Yeah, so, um, uh, so this is, this, this is a, it's a simple thing. Uh, simple but unexpected, and um, pretty fundamental at some level, right? Um, whatever fundamental means. I don't want to boast about it being fundamental because it was so easy to derive, but you know, it's pretty fundamental. Okay. So are, are there questions about this before I go on to the, the second, much shorter part of the, the talk? This is, this is work from a paper in science that I wrote uh, um, about in 2005. It also appeared, actually ironically, it appeared first in Scientific American. Okay. If, you, there is this, if you want to see cool pictures of this kind of stuff, this Scientific American article which is called Black Hole Quantum Computers or something like that. Like, uh, <laughs> it's like it's got, it was a cover article. It's got this amazing picture of all these bits being sucked into a black hole. It's really, really awesome. There are great pictures in that article. So, <laughs> all right. So, um, uh, uh, okay, well, if there's no questions about that, more questions about this. I mean, I think it's something to think about, right? Um, let, me now, let, me, let me now go on and tell you something which I think is quite remarkable. Um, you may not, but that's okay. I think it is, and so I'm going to tell you anyway, which I just came up with this last summer. This is unpublished work. No, it's on the archive. It's, it's one of my most recent papers posted on the archive, if you just want to look, at, look for it. So, um, let's, let's just start from this now. Let's start from this, this quantum geometric limit. And suppose we hadn't gone through the whole derivation, and suppose I just told you 
that, you know, or somebody came along and said, hey, every event, every op is associated with some two-dimensional two -dimensional area somehow in space and time, and so along some space time, in some space time volume, okay? What could you do with that? So, um, uh, is, does somebody have a piece of paper that they don't mind me um, destroying? <laughs> Great, this will be fine, perfect. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now is I will show to you that if we, uh, if we assume, so each, each up corresponds to Planck scale area, something that's like alpha times LP times TP, some Planck scale area. Suppose, just for the heck of it, suppose that <clears throat> this area is an area that is removed. I think I'll stop using this as soon as I'm done with it. From <clears throat> some 2D surface. So suppose this area is an area removed from a two-dimensional surface. Now what happens when you take a bit of area out of a two-dimensional surface? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to remove area by rip this and now I'm going to make these overlap. So I, the area of the surface is now, is now less. So what happens to the surface? It curves. It curves. So removing area induces curvature. And here we have, you know, an op is something that's an energy times time. So if we say something like this, we see, look, if that's so, then energy followed over time induces curvature. It induces curvature in space and time. Thank you. It's not that destroyed. <laughs> and what I'll now show you is that if this is so, then this implies Einstein's equations. All right, so then this is not obvious at all. It could make it curve in some really ridiculous kind of way. Okay, but in fact, I'll show you that this actually makes, gives you Einstein's equations. So um, Einstein's equations, so let's, okay, let's, let me draw a funny picture. And then, um, then uh, yeah, I don't have that much time, so I'm not sure how many equations I'll put in, but uh, maybe I could even just, I might just try to state it. But let me just draw the picture. So let's take one of these clocks. Here's this clock. Uh, it's moving along, it's ticking over time, <clears throat> and uh, we're going to define, we want to define this, let's use this clock to define one of these three plus one dimensional cylinders. So we want to take a sphere and we want to follow it over time t. So how do we define a sphere? You define a sphere in the following fashion. At this point, let's say at this initial point right here, this clock emits a pulse of light that's going forward in time, right? And now let's suppose that at this point there's a spherical mirror that surrounds this, which reflects this and sends it back and it gets absorbed, reconverges on the clock at this point in time. So um, uh, this is our, this is our over C, this is R over C. So um, the way that you map out a sphere in space and time is that uh, you take, let me now draw a two-dimensional cross-section of the sphere. It's, it's kind of hard to draw these things, right? Because I'm trying to draw something in four dimensions and two dimensions. And again, I have to do some kind of projection-like thing. But let's imagine that this, what, what I've drawn here, since if you imagine this in three dimensions now, this is a circular cross-section of the three-dimensional sphere that was made by this forward light cone coming out here and the backward light cone coming from there. And this is what's caused a uh, causal diamond. Like Mitsubishi is diamond, right? Mitsubishi. Yeah. Three. yeah. Three diamonds. Three diamonds, right. So a diamond, right, Bishi. Right, yeah. causal, I don't know what causal is in Japanese. But. So this is, this is a causal bishi. All right. <laughs> okay, so <clears throat> let's, let's ask him about the number. Let's suppose here's, there's a bunch of energy in this and let's just see what happens here. So 
I'm going to tell you that the energy, the number of ops, now I've got to do things in, um, in, in uh, kind of relativistic terms. So if you don't like G mu nus and T mu nus and things like that, you can just like turn off for just a second. Uh, uh, Feynman supposedly, he was, went to a conference about general relativity in some place, and when he got there, he found that he hadn't brought any information about where the hotel was, where the conference venue was, and he, he got to the airport and he had no idea where to go. So what he did is he went to the taxi rank and he asked the taxi driver, he said, did a bunch of people saying things like G mu nu, G mu nu come through here? <laughs> Take me where they went. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so here is, this is, we'll call this vector, this vector here, we'll call this u mu. So this is the time-like vector that the clock is following. And so this right here, this is the energy momentum tensor, this is energy density. We have this, we have to multiply times the volume, it turns out the volume of this causal b she is 2 pi r cubed times t. So this is energy density times volume is uh, energy times T. This is this energy time product. So this is the number of ops. All right. Now, let's suppose that in this picture right here, I guess I will use green again just for the heck of it. Suppose we actually remove some little area right here, this area A. And then we glue these bits together which will make the interior of the sphere curve. All right? So, this area, let's let this area, right, well, there are many areas, two-dimensional areas we could look at, but let's just look at this one right now. So, <clears throat> the curvature is proportional to the area that's removed. All right? And actually, in this case, the curvature is proportional to the area divided by r to the fourth, times c. And actually I think it's times 12, but don't, don't, uh, don't quote me on that. Uh, <laughs> uh, this is the, uh, it's a theorem by Gauss. It's an old, an old theorem. <clears throat> so if we take, I drew one of these cross sections right here. There are actually three of them. So the, the, the curvature, the total curvature removed, if I take area from each of them, the total curvature removed is something like k12 plus k23 plus, actually, so I, I shouldn't use this, this, this marker because it is not so good. So the total curvature is k12 plus k23 plus k31 um, times some constant divided by r to the fourth. No, excuse me, this is a, a times r to the fourth, excuse me. And we'll just call it times r cubed t. And there's going to be some constant here. Um, and it's something, it's probably 12 or something like that. But again, you can look at the paper to find the actual constants. All right, so this is, uh, this, is this area. And so what this says is this, if we say that the number of ops each op, which is this is the number of ops, removes some area like this, it should say that this is proportional to that. All right? So each one of these, each op, should remove some little Planck scale area from this. Oh yeah, and I, I, I neglected there's an H bar here. So, Actually, the neat thing about this is that the sums of these curvatures, this is something I derived myself after weeks of agony, and then I found out it was a, not a well-known fact, but a known fact. It's in Pauli's book on general relativity. This is actually r mu nu minus one half g mu nu r times u mu u nu. If you ask what the Einstein tensor, which is this r mu nu minus one half g mu nu r is, it's the thing which, when you contract it with u mu and u nu, tells you how these two-dimensional surfaces, spatial surfaces, curve. Apparently this is how Riemann originally, Pauli says this is how Riemann originally came up with the notion of curvature. Like, uh, like I mean, uh, I'm not good. I can imagine two-dimensional curvature because I can imagine things embedded in three dimensions. 
but I have a hard time imagining curvature of a three-dimensional space. And maybe some people here are better than that than I am, but, but, but anyway, I, most people do, okay? However, we can, you know, it's not hard to imagine, as I was describing before, if I take some, some disk in a, embedded in a three-dimensional space, I can ask about the two-dimensional curvature of this disk. And what Riemann essentially did, the way he came up with Riemann geometry, was he said, oh, I can't imagine this other stuff, but let's imagine these curvature of these two-dimensional disks. And so this, this actually formula, in some sense, actually dates back to the very origins of, uh, of um, Riemannian geometry. And so our ansatz is that these, this is proportional to each other. These are proportional to each other. And so what this actually implies is that uh, 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 2 pi h bar t mu nu, u mu, u nu, um, is proportional to um, r mu nu minus 1 half g mu nu r u mu u nu. And um, we actually had to say, this is the number of ops, we had to multiply this times the Planck length times the Planck time. Um, so uh, uh, we multiply this, sorry, this is times the Planck length times the Planck time. But the Planck length times the Planck time, you may remember, is c to the fourth over h bar g. The h bars cancels out. And if this alpha is equal to 1 over pi squared, actually, I forget with these c's, so I guess it must be 4 over pi squared here. Excuse me. No, pi squared over 1 over 4 pi squared. Then this is Einstein's equations. So I even actually did the math. Okay. But so, so I mean, this, this is the translation into terms of Riemannian geometry, what it means for an op to remove some area inducing curvature. That actually ends up being Einstein's equations. And what Einstein's equations, and by the way, I, you know, I, I actually studied, took general relativity a number of times. I even took Stephen Hawking's quantum gravity seminar when I was a graduate student. And I have to say, I never understood Einstein's equations, despite doing lots of calculations in which I got, sometimes got the right answers. But this actually, when I figured this out, I've said, oh, well, now I think I understand it. What it says is like, you know, an op, an energy time product in the temporal direction induces curvature in the three-dimensional volume uh, that's perpendicular to that. And we can think of this curvature as just these curvature of these two-dimensional surfaces within this three-dimensional volume. So, so uh, this is kind of, again, I don't really know how to, how, to, how to treat this. It's a derivation of Einstein's equations from a quantum mechanical statement. I mean, this really is you know, some kind of quantum mechanical statement. The quantum mechanical statement, when you combine it with gravity at a large scale, you know, never, I never actually, the Planck length only showed up here because it had to, it's a dimensionless quantity that depends on h bar g, t, and r. So it had to be like this. But I never did this thing that people do like in quantum field theory where they say, oh, we have some Planck scale cut off on the fields, quantum fields here. That's, that's not part of this, right? So first I derived this in two lines. And then this says, hey, ops are associated with area. And then I have to say that, that even though this, this actually, the derivation of this is not, it's slightly more complicated really than what I put down here, but it's not that much more complicated. And it really took me two years to find, you know, in, in the end, in the end, if you take, go the opposite direction and you say, oh, well, let's like take, say ops remove area, they induce curvature, what happens? Well, what happens is you get Einstein's equations. So. What's the, what's the, uh Comments you get from from other physicists when you when you talk about this? I'm just curious. Well, <laughs> polite, 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 polite denial. No, <laughs> they ignore it. No, actually, um, in fact, um, so there's a quite a famous paper from in the quantum gravity community by Ted Jacobson. I'll put down his name. So, uh, Ted Jacobson in 1995 showed that, that if you take horizon radiation, so if you have a space time that has a horizon, like a black hole, but you can have a horizon just with an observer who's accelerating. So horizon radiation 
Uh, so here's some horizon. Horizons are always light-like, okay? <laughs> this is a horizon. That's a, I know it doesn't look like much like a horizon. <laughs> you know, it's a horizon in the sense that if something goes through here, then somebody who lives outside this horizon will never see anything more of it. Horizon radiation that has a temperature T, a temperature T, which is, you know, uh, 1 over ds dE. So these horizons have temperatures, the temperature of Hawking radiation if it's a black hole, plus... Uh, entropy area law. So this is this this uh, this is this uh, information area law from holography. So one bit of entropy corresponds to like some Planck length squared. And you take these things together and you say when when this thing according to this observer when this thing right here with energy E crosses the horizon at temperature T because there's Hawking radiation. He thinks of this thing as cre creating entropy because it's now lost and it fell into some bath at temperature T. And you take this entropy area law and you say, oh, let's remove a bit from a, a, a Planck length scale area from the horizon. So this, this, this is a famous paper and that implies Einstein's equations. So, so that was my inspiration for this. Uh, uh, I mean, this took, this took forever. I mean, this kind of thing I've been working on for more than 10 years and this specific approach for like two years. But so starting from this, I said, well, okay, you know, this entropy area law from holography, this, computa this is a computational analogy from it. It's an op area law. Maybe if there's an, you can derive Einstein's equations from an entropy area law, you can derive them from this op area uh, area law. And actually the derivation is a lot simpler than this one in this Jacobson paper. Yeah, so people seem to like it. I mean, I don't know. The, the quantum gravity, having, I've been working in this field now for 10 years and it's kind of a dismal field because so little progress has been made in the last century. I mean, it's really almost a century since people, as soon as Einstein came out with a theory of general relativity, people started trying and failing to quantize it. And really it's like uh, not a lot of, I mean a lot of progress has been made, a lot of work has been done, but nobody feels that they actually know the solution to how to quantize gravity. Or the ones who do are wrong, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, so I think people, I mean, I don't know. I'm, I'm, one of the reasons I'm going around giving talks about this is I wish to advertise this result and then also see if I can't get some string theorist, well, string theorists will never pay attention to it because it's not string theory, but um, you know, get some, some uh, uh, comments from people doing things like quantum gravity. And I've been giving talks at quantum gravity conferences and talking with string theorists and quantum gravity people, quite a few of them. So, I mean, I think they, I'd say that, that some of them find it intriguing, let's put it that way. Okay. Good. Thank you. Okay, that's it.